The Best Way to Explain It, Episode 7. Scott and Brecken, the fine folks from The Best Way to Explain It, a show with only half of the charisma of Don Draper, but none of the lung cancer. Brecken, how's it going? <laughs> that is by far the best introduction we have so far. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, I don't know. I We might have a quarter of the lung cancer, but we'll get to yeah. that later. Uh, maybe not yet, though. <laughs> okay. So it's Halloween. Tonight, we're yes. recording this on Halloween, and, and I have a question that I I just need to know the answer to. Is candy corn good? I would say yes. Okay, you like candy corn. Yeah. I, I don't think that has an answer, though. How so? Okay. I can't... Okay, if I were to tell you that I liked candy corn, I couldn't tell you why I liked candy corn. That's a good point. <laughs> I, I, it's such a simple candy. It's like, uh, it's like fudge or, or just a normal Hershey's bar. You, but it's you just like, like it cause it's candy. I don't know. But no. Okay. So like Hershey's it's, you know, chocolate and it's the original chocolate or whatever. Okay, yeah. And you know, it's got, it's got that going for it, but candy corn, isn't that just sugar and got corn syrup or something? I, it has like a caramel flavor to it though. So, uh, I don't think it does I, a little bit. What does it taste like? It tastes like candy corn. <laughs> I don't know what that means. That's like asking what rosemary tastes like. It, it tastes <laughs> like rosemary. There's nothing I can really point to. Oh, it just bugs me. Cause I, I eat it and I just can't decide if, if what I'm eating is good food or not. Yeah. I understand. And, and it bugs me. I've I've never thought this hard about candy corn, and now I'm questioning my entire life. Did you ever? So Lewis Black, in one of his stand-ups, he started this myth that all the candy corn that was ever produced was produced in like 1912, and all that we're <laughs> eating today is just everything that everyone's thrown away, and they just keep collecting it, and they've never manufactured any more. <laughs> that's that's a very unique recycling pattern, but. <laughs> You know, I just remember when I saw that, and it was so funny. <laughs> but apparently, people actually they they peddle those those theories, and yeah, I guess it's a legitimate thing. Yeah, well, I I have been seeing a lot of internet memes that are all about how candy corn is disgusting, and I'm like, I can't relate. I shove shovel that into my mouth, but. I, I couldn't, okay, I couldn't say it's disgusting either. I couldn't say it's delicious, but I can't say it's disgusting. It's just candy yeah. corn. Yeah. It's a good mm. middle of the road for yeah. when when you know you're going to be disappointed, so you might as well just eat the cheap candy corn and not, <laughs> you know, like actual candy. But there's something about candy corn. It's better than like the candy pumpkins. Oh, yeah, by far. But I don't know why. I, I imagine they're made of the same thing. I it has something to do with the dye. The dye. That's why okay. the brown M and M's are the best. Hmm. Yeah. I have, I have a buddy who thinks that all Skittles taste the same. Interesting. Yeah. I I would say the lemon ones give it away. The those don't taste the same. Yeah. Well. I I don't know. Like, it's they don't taste like what they're supposed to taste like but i think there's there's a distinction yeah they it's a minor one but yeah yeah i don't know candy just halloween candy just it brings out these conversations and and i don't know what to do with it (laughs) have you ever tried the andy dwyer mouth surprise where you sandwich two skittles in between two starbursts because the skittles really bring out a similar flavor in the starburst (laughs) <laughs> no <laughs> wait what episode was that from uh it's one of the halloween ones oh. I, I think it's halloween episode two or something okay yeah I, I don't know it's been a while since i've 
done a watch of that show. I'm pretty sure my girlfriend and I binge watched an entire season on Sunday after we finished Stranger Things 2. Oh, you finally finished that? Yeah. Finally. Oh, <laughs> it just came out Friday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like it's like really late for a lot of people. Yeah, that's true. Not me. I still haven't started. I need to. Come on, man. I know. I suck. Yeah. So, uh, since we uh, went down that rabbit hole, how's what? about we get back on track and you tell everyone what we're learning today? You know, if we get off off track as much as we do, isn't being on track kind of being off track? <sighs> You're going down another rabbit hole, <laughs> and I love it. All right, so for those of you who have been paying attention to this podcast, you know that I am going to be doing my second part in my series on the internet. So last time, or last time I talked, uh, we talked about the history of the internet, kind of how it began, the big names, and we kind of briefly discussed some of the technologies that are used in it, but now... Now, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to get into the real meat of the discussion. Basically, how exactly it does what it does. And if you remember what I talked about last time, you'll know that I mentioned something called the TCP IP protocol suite. And if you need a refresher uh, or you just missed that episode, be sure to check that out at thebestwaytoexplainit.com slash five. And I'm just going to assume that you've listened to that episode. So if you feel lost, don't blame me. Just listen to that episode and you should be fine. Also, something I'm doing for this series, just because it, just to make it easier, if you guys go to the best way to explain it dot com slash internet, I'm gonna be that'll just be a list of all the internet episodes that I have, and so that way you don't have to find them every other one on our uh, on our feed or whatever you call it. That's and pretty so, handy. Yeah, I just thought I'd throw that together, um, just for you guys. Yeah. So look at you looking out for the listeners. That's what I do. So, all right. S- since uh, Scott's looking out for you, you should look out for us and share the show with your friends. That's actually a really good point. Boom. It. I can't say any better than that. Yeah. Nice, but, nice and concise. Now let's get back to the internet. Now, if you guys share that show, <laughs> I will do my best to not get off track during the explanation. <laughs> okay, well. Okay, we, we know that was a lie. Okay, that, yeah, I've lined straight through my teeth, but please do share the show. <laughs> that'd be it. That'd be really awesome. Um, okay, so the TCP IP protocol suite. If we can understand this idea, then we are basically going to understand the internet. So, uh, yeah, that, that, that's what we're going to do. Boom. And to be honest, it's not really that hard if you chunk it up correctly. Uh, you can't really try and understand the internet all at once. You've got to break it up into manageable, logical portions. And so, but the nice thing is that the TCP IP protocol suite breaks down fairly neatly into what we call the layers of the internet. Now, the word layers does not actually refer to some physical separation of the internet because all these layers are necessary for the internet to work, but rather they're just helpful abstractions of those parts. So when I talk about each layer separately, I'll be talking somewhat as if it's isolated from the rest of the layers, but it's not. All the layers work together, and I'm going to explain as best as I can how exactly that is at each layer. So that's what I mean when I talk about layers. Um, so some people, I think I mentioned this at the end of the last episode, but some people break down the internet and do seven layers, others do it in five layers, and some do it in four layers. Uh, and then this is mainly due to the combination or separation of certain layers that some people feel are better representative of the way the internet is structured. Is and is one of the layers ice cream or cheesecake? Um, no, and <sighs> you're getting me off track again. I'm sorry. Wow. I, I suck. The Halloween, the candy, it's all getting to my head. Yeah. I No joke, I downed probably 700 calories worth of candy just before this podcast started so we'll see how this goes yeah i've I've had about five reese's pieces in the last hour so reese's pieces uh, or not reese's pieces just reese's reese's pieces i know oh. <laughs> criticize me <laughs> <laughs> no i yeah i had i had a bunch of sugar it's this is gonna be rough but we'll see how i do yeah. Okay. So some people like seven layers, some people like five layers, others like four layers, and that's just kind of personal preference. I like the five layer model. I think it is the easiest to explain to people. Um, so I think we're gonna just use that. But if you hear 
if you ever hear about the four or seven layers of the internet, just know that some people break out some of these layers that I'll talk about into separate layers themselves. And for reference, the seven layer model is referred to as the OSI or Open Systems Interconnection Model, whereas the four and five layer models are referred to as the internet model, uh, also like specifically the TCP IP model. And within each of these layers, I'm going to break down specific terminology and give some helpful analogies so that those with no technical background can understand them. And that's kind of the point of this show. So don't assume that you need any technical background. All you'll need to do is just make sure you've listened to all of the episodes previously. So I so they can the be like me and they can know about the internet. Basically, yep. Except probably smarter because they're more gifted intellectually. Yeah, true. Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, wow, that was really mean, but it's pretty on par. It's so. okay. I'm only a little sad. Yeah. Well, let's let's make you happy by discussing the internet. So, a few things to keep in mind before we get started talking about the first layer. The first one is that most of these layers are going to have this idea of an address. So when I talk about addresses, it's exactly what you think it means. So if you think about when you're sending a letter to someone, if anyone still ever does that anymore, uh, the post office has to know where to send that letter. It's the same way on the internet. You're sending information from one place to another, so that specific layer has to know where to send the information, right? And then, so the second thing you have to remember is that each layer is going to have its own protocol data unit, or PDU for short. And this is going to refer to exactly how the information is structured and packaged at that layer. So if you think about it this way, how do we structure and package the information we send when we send a letter? Well, we put it on a piece of paper and stick it in an envelope, right? Well, similarly, each layer of the internet is going to have information to send, so there's some uniform way in which that information is going to need to look. And that's what we're going to refer to as the PDU, or the Protocol Data Unit. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, that definitely makes sense. Sweet. So we're so for this episode, we're going to talk about the first layer of the internet, uh, which is the physical layer. So in the four-layer model, this layer is actually combined with the next layer up, which is called the link layer, and these, this physical link layer amalgamation is called the link layer in the four-layer model. So these two are very closely related, but I kind of like breaking them up. I just think it makes it a bit easier to explain. And so this layer refers to the physical connections that are used to send the actual electrical signals from one computer or device to another. And we're going to refer to any computer or device as a host from now on. So just know when I say the word host, I mean like your laptop, phone, desktop, anything else that you have that connects to the internet. Toaster, oven, microwave, You, crocs, you name it. I don't know. F- refrigerator. Yeah. Hmm. Actually, I think there are some that do. Yeah. There are. So that's what a host is from here on out. Okay. So, well, no, because you and I are not devices that connect to the internet. But See what I did there? But do you know that? What if we're in the matrix? This is true. In which case, uh, none of this actually matters because the internet's probably really different outside the matrix. You know how I know we're not in the matrix, though? How's that? This whiskey would taste better. Mm. Maybe your how do you know whether that whiskey tastes like whiskey? Maybe your brain you know, <laughs> you, you know what quote I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I got you. Okay, that yeah. Watch the Matrix if you haven't. Small, it's awesome. Small so. sidetrack aside. <laughs> that wasn't too bad. Yeah. Okay. So let's look at how exactly the physical sublayer of the link layer works. So suppose you have two different hosts. So two different hosts. In order to send information between these hosts, we need to be able to have some sort of connection between them, right? This connection is going to need to be able to send our protocol data unit for this layer. And you may have guessed it, but the PDU for this layer is a bit. If you remember from the CPU episode, which you guys can listen to at thebestwaytoexplainit.com slash one, a bit is a zero or one value represented as an electrical signal. So what sort of connection are we going to use? Well, there are two different ways in which hosts can be connected to each other. They can be wired or they can be wireless. Pretty obvious, right? Yeah. So let's break down the physical structures of these two possibilities in turn. Okay, so first we're going to talk about wired connections. So what might a wired connection require? 
Well, if one's going to send bits down a wired connection, there obviously needs to be a wire, right? <laughs> uh, so within, da- when, within today's internet, there are a few different options that are used for wiring. There's your Ethernet cable, of which there are two kinds, unshielded twisted pair and shielded twisted pair. There are coaxial cables and fiber optic cables. So those are just a few of your different options, and we're going to look at each of, each of these briefly and kind of tell you what's different between each of them. So we have your unshielded twisted pair Ethernet cable. So chances are you probably have one of these at home because the Ethernet cable just has that little um, has the little connector that like clicks in at the you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you you probably know what an Ethernet cable is. Um, so this is the first one in the Ethernet family, and you've probably used one of these before, and you probably might even be using one now. So these are cables that are made of copper wires, and you guessed it, they're twisted together a certain number of times per inch. And the wires are twisted together in order to help eliminate interference because these wires emit electromagnetic signals um, from other adjacent pairs and electronic devices. And then these twisted wires are then covered in the plastic coating that you'll see when you look at one, and they have what's called an RJ45 connector on both ends, which is that little clippy thing with the push down thingy that always breaks <laughs> the push down thingy i love yeah, those it. are those are my very technical terms for yes. it but those always break on me so that's yeah. well really it's a it's a clinical term yeah exactly yeah. if you talk it's an industry industry standard so. yeah yeah our push down thingy broke <laughs> well got to throw out that 20 <laughs> foot cable now <laughs> Okay, so that's the unshielded twisted pair, and then there's also the shielded twisted pair, and these are constructed very similarly to uh, UTP cables, except that they have, you guessed it, shielding on the pairs of wires. Um, And this helps to prevent the interference that is usually present in UTP cables. Uh, The shields are made of foil, and they're also found around all of the wires together, which is called a double shield twisted pair. And now the shielding makes these cables more expensive, which is why UTP cables are more popular at this time. But if you need to place these cables near items that emit a lot of electrical frequency interference, then you might want to spend a little extra and get an STP cable. And these will also have your RJ45 connectors with the plastic around the cables. So so, so I'm curious, for those mm-hmm. who have seen a server room or something... Uh, do they use UTP or STP cables, or do you know what the, the um, it just depends. For that is? It oh, depends yeah. on the setup. Uh, I would guess probably a lot use shielded twisted pairs. Um, I'm sure some probably use um, UTPs, but it just kind of depends how complicated your server setup is going to be because if there's a lot of different wires that are in a lot of different things that are emitting electromagnetic frequencies, then you're going to want to use the shielded twisted pair. Okay, but it yeah it just kind of depends on how much money you want to spend. I mean, shielded twisted pairs. I've got a few of them. They're not that much more expensive. Yeah, and, I mean, I and I don't use them to prevent you know frequency interference. I just I don't know. I'm a perfectionist, and they're better. So okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I probably you're spent a, money on it that you're it wasn't a computer necessary. Nerd. Pretty much. Yeah, yeah. And so those are Ethernet cables. Um. Or the two kinds of Ethernet cables. And now we have coaxial cables. And this is another type of cable that you've probably seen. So these are the types of cables that you might screw into the back of your TV or, you know, you guessed it again, cable modems, right? So coaxial cable, cable modem. Wow, how uh, they did can that work? Si- yeah, I don't know. They're really co- We're really creative in our, <laughs> you know, naming of things. And so these coaxial cables, they consist of, from the inside out, a center core made of copper conductor, and then just outside of that, a dielectric insulator, and then a metallic shield, and then the plastic jacket on the outside. Uh, The conductor is for the electrical signals. The insulator keeps the shield from touching the conductor, and which would make the shield somewhat useless if it touched the conductor. And then the shield does what the shield does in the STP, which prevents interference. And then the plastic covering keeps it all together. So that's the that's coaxial cables. Um, and then finally, we have the fiber optic cable. And there's a good chance you've probably never seen a fiber optic cable, as these tend to be used by larger corporations. Although lately, 
internet service providers or ISPs have begun to offer this option in more locations. So fiber optic cables consist of, from the inside out, again, a glass core in the center, then just outside of that, plastic coating to cushion the glass, and then Kevlar fibers for strength of the cable, and then a Teflon or PVC outer layer. Now, what makes fiber optic cables unique is that rather than using electricity to send information, it uses light signals. And what this does is that it prevents electrical interference from being a factor, as well as making this cable capable of really fast speeds. And I really want one. Because... I, do you want to like? Do you want an actual uh, fiber optic cable, or do you want fiber optic cables to bring all of your? information to where you live well both because uh, if i so if i had fiber optic cables so if i paid for fiber internet speeds right yeah if i don't use fiber optic cables i'm not gonna be able to take advantage of that speed because then whatever speed my current cable is at that's i mean that'll be a bottleneck and so i would need Okay, second second question to go along with this. Uh, mm-hmm. And I know the speed of light is obviously the fastest uh, something can travel that we know of. Mm-hmm. Um, is that the only reason that it's faster? Or do you know anything about the resistance within the cables? Is that uh, what causes the speeds to be slower between the, the fiber optic cables and then the other electromagnetic cables? I think it's the light. Okay. It's the, it's the fact that they transmit information using light. Okay. And that also kind of helps with... So the trouble with Ethernet and coax cables is that they're susceptible somewhat, though less so nowadays, to what's called vampires, which are... They, they're physical things that you can clamp on one of those cables and you can actually siphon off data that's going down those okay. cables. And uh, because fiber optic cables, if the light gets, I don't know, shifted in any way, Refracted it actually just kind of, yeah. Yeah. It kind of just makes the information somewhat useless. And okay. so you kind of can, produ- I mean, they have made, you know, vampires for fiber optic cables, but they're a bit more expensive and they're a lot more delicate. So. Okay. That's also cool. Yeah. And I also, I also just want a fiber optic cable because I'd love to just take one apart and kind of look at it. Yeah. Because they're they're pretty cool. Okay, so now that you know what each of these cables are, I'm just going to briefly talk about the pros and cons of each. Now, obviously, since UTP cables are extremely popular, they're quite cheap. Um, so if you need to just hook up your computer to your router and your setup isn't terribly complicated, you'll be fine with a UTP cable. Now, there are different categories of UTP and STP, which are called CAT X, where X is the category number. So most of what you'll see today is CAT 5 end up. Now, this category just refers to how fast the cable is. So the higher the category number, the faster the cable is, the faster capability the cable speed can can go. Um, Though price increases as category increases, obviously. Now, the nice thing about coaxial cables is that it really doesn't have many problems with interference just because of how well shielded it is. And they ha- they tend to have similar speeds to UTP and STP, so you're not losing much there. But the big downside with the coax cable is that they do not bend well at all, and they really suck to install. I hate using coax cables. Oh, I, I hate coax. <laughs> really annoying. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so in my dorm room, actually, uh, last year, I plugged in a coax cable to the cable box on the wall. Yeah. And so I, I did the whole screwing it in and everything. But the little sh- sharp needle pin thingy, it got bent. Oh, no. And I could not get the cable to come out of the wall. And so I just left it there. Actually, you know what? That was two years ago. Because then when I came back into the room the next year, it was still there. So nobody <laughs> was able to get it out. And... and it was nuts. <laughs> That's funny. So yeah, coax cables kind of just suck to like install and, and and do any changing with. But you know they're pretty uh pretty comparable to a UTP or STP cable. Yeah. And then finally, fiber optic cables are the best cable to use if you have the money to use them. They're quite expensive though, and 
especially expensive to set up, but they do offer the best speeds and reliability, which is, again, why most corporations and governments tend to use them. But if you can use them, I would definitely recommend doing it. And I guess another thing you probably want to be careful with is that since the glass core can break if you bend it too much, uh, they're a bit more fragile than, say, your regular Ethernet cable, which can, you know, bend pretty well. Um, so just be careful if you're using a fiber optic cable. And that would be my recommendation. So the the fiber optic cables, they can bend, right? But you just don't want to bend them too much? Yeah, yeah. Okay. They, they're, I mean, they're capable of it. It's just... If you would, to, if you were to try and bend it at like a ninety degree angle, angle, it would snap. Okay. And then be useless. Okay. And so, since they're very expensive, you want to be very careful about that. Interesting. Yeah. So, just be careful. But if you want to and you know what you're doing, definitely they're worth the speed boost because, like, you can get speeds up to, I don't know. Over a gigabyte per second. Holy smokes. That would or be gig- sweet. gigabit or whatever. I don't know. Um, yeah, you can download movies like really quickly. That would be like Madden in 20 seconds. Yeah. I think. Yeah. No, it's it's pretty nuts. And I think actually a lot of college universities use them. Yeah. So I'm pretty sure I have fiber here, but I don't have a fiber cable that plugs in i just use ethernet so there's a bit of a um, bottleneck there yeah the internet was always pretty good there I, oh, you had so to nice. use it for just about anything you did for class so yeah no it's it's good except really seemingly unreliable and constantly dropping connections but <laughs> you know when you're actually connected it's pretty nice yeah all right so those are your options for wired connections now, there might be a few other cables that I didn't mention, but those are kind of hipster cables, and not many people use them. So that's what you really need to know. But the the main <laughs> point, if we're explaining the Internet, is that there are wires that connect hosts which are able to send information in a format that works for the host to understand. So... That's kind of what you need to know about that. Okay, so we talked about wired connections, but most of us use wireless connections, right? Like nobody really you know, brings their phone around and plugs directly into a wall in order to use the internet. They do it wirelessly, but you know, how does that work? Well, wireless networks use different kinds of electromagnetic waves to carry the same information that the wired connections do. And there are, again, a number of different options that are used, including infrared, satellite, broadcast radio, microwave radio, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, and mobile networks. So we'll talk about each of those just briefly. So there's infrared is the first one I talked about, which uses IR radiation. And IR is just electromagnetic energy with a wavelength longer than red light. And it's usually found in security controls, TV remotes, and more shorter range stuff. And it requires a photo LED transmitter and photodiode receptor. Now, the transmitter transmits IR signal in form of non-visible light, which is captured and saved by the receptor. And it's usually more of a line-of-sight, short-range technology. And this is... So, infrared would be something that might be used by a remote control for your TV. So, that uses IR. Though, they found some ways to make it less line-of-sight. Yeah. Less... dependent on that but that might be an example of an ir connection my cable remote is line of sight ir with my cable box here at home Mm -hmm. and our cable box sits directly in the path of a bar that blocks that line of sight area (laughs) it's the most frustrating thing ever first world problems yep (laughs) that's funny but Yeah, okay, and I guess something I probably will mention just real quick. So I'll be talking about waves and wavelengths. So essentially, electromagnetic energy, it it does this thing where... How do you explain (laughs) wavelengths without showing somebody? (laughs) Okay, um, I'll do my best here. So light 
comes across in waves. So you have different wavelengths. I, I'm not going to go into describing how the waves work, but That's just fine. assume that they're waves. And the shorter the wave gets, the it produces a different color. That's why you see the rainbow. So really the rainbow is light refracting into Roy G. Biv, red, orange, yellow, uh, green, blue, indigo, violet. And, sure. and through those ranges, you have the visible light spectrum, which I just listed out. And then you have on the red side, you have infrared, which is a longer wavelength than red, like Scott said. And then on the other side, you have ultraviolet or UV light, which is what, you know, gives you cancer or <laughs> uh, makes your clothes <laughs> look really cool in a dance club. And okay. Yeah, that's that's the wavelength. So right. it, it just changes the visible or invisible spectrum that you're seeing. Right. If you've ever looked at the graph of a sine wave and and that's a trigono- trigonometry term, uh that that's a way you can think about it. So a a sine wave that is that there there are fewer it, it crosses the x-axis um more times in a smaller space yep is a shorter wavelength so if you don't know what a sine wave is just google s i n e wave and you'll look at a graph and you'll kind of see what i'm talking about and yeah so th- there you go <laughs> <laughs> that's probably that that's our abridged version of wavelengths and sine waves and light waves right so basically these waves are able to transmit information and that, that's what we use for wireless technologies. And so infrared's our first one. The second one is satellite. Now this uses microwaves, not the kitchen appliance, but uh, they're another type of wave that we're talking about. And they use microwaves to send data. And so someone sends a signal up to a satellite above the earth and the satellite then amplifies and sends the signal back down to earth to the receiving antenna. Now, they're pretty expensive because, you know, satellites obviously have to be put above the Earth, but they're extremely powerful, and this would be used for GPS and military stuff, though there are satellite internet services. So if you were to live out in the, you know, middle of nowhere and you wanted to get internet, well, chances are you would have to get satellite internet because it's expensive for an internet service provider to wire, to provide wiring all the way out to your house in order for them to, well... Because, you know, your your home network needs to have a wire coming into it in order for what's called your wireless access point to provide you wireless internet. So, But that needs to be connected to a wire somewhere. And But with satellite, you don't actually have to run wiring out there. You can just use satellites to get your internet. And that's why people out in the country tend to have satellite internet. Cool. I didn't know that, actually. Yep, yep. And we'll talk more about routers and all of that in later episodes. But Sweet. I'm actually writing that part right now, and it's really complicated. <laughs> we're we're going to have like a five-hour-long episode. Yeah, of you just it's going to be a long one. It's going to sound like a conspiracy theory about the internet. I'm gonna, it'll, I'll be like that Charlie Day <laughs> yes. meme where I, he's like... I love how you and I both pictured the same meme. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> Look up Charlie Day. I don't know. It's off of It's All is Sunny in Philadelphia. Yeah. Uh, just look up. Charlie Day meme would probably Charlie be. Charlie Day meme would make you. Conspiracy. It would pop up some funny pictures either way. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You'll know what we're talking about. <laughs> so there's your memes for the day. Uh, <laughs> Okay, so after satellite, we have broadcast radio, which was the first real wireless technology that we had. So essentially, broadcasts will uh, it broadcast sound through the air as radio waves, and this uses a transmitter and a receiving antenna, and the different channels use different frequencies, and so, you know, 89.9 FM means signals broadcast at a frequency of 89,900,000 cycles per second. Uh, so that's what we're talking about when you're like rotating that thing on your radio, that dial, you're, you're tuning it, you're trying to, uh, make your antenna 
listen for radio waves at the frequency of, you know, 89 million, 900,000. Right. And so this, a radio wave is, is just another type of wave that we've been talking about. And so things like car radios and handheld radios use this type of technology. Something that, something that's really cool about, uh, it's about all waves, but we don't really see it with light. Uh, we can use the antennas on our car, like Scott was saying, to receive these uh, signals. But these signals have a measurable length per sp- like space. And if you hit a certain point in that length, you actually get the best reception for each separate signal. Uh, with your antenna so if your antenna is like one meter long it gets the signal from 89.9 at a certain delivery as opposed to like if it were at the perfect peak uh, size I learned that in like physics too so nice it was really cool yeah yeah I didn't get much into like how waves and all that stuff works yeah I'm just gonna for explaining the internet, it's kind of just important that you know that it is a thing that works. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, we might get want... into like light waves and sound waves and stuff later. Yeah. Some later episode. That would be Send us a suggestion on the best way to explain it.com slash suggestions. If you want to learn more about waves and all that fun stuff. Yeah. We've actually been getting a lot of suggestions. So really appreciate that guys. Keep, yeah. Keep sending them. Rock. And maybe we'll finally get out from under our, mountain of suggestions and, <laughs> yeah but hey do that because then we don't have to think about new topics yeah so definitely that's very helpful make our jobs easy okay so uh what did we just finish broadcast radio so the fourth one i want to talk about is microwave radio now this uses radio waves that can be transferred either by satellite or by line of sight to two earth towers So either the transmitter is going to send signals up to the satellite, which are then sent back down in the 11 gigahertz to 14 gigahertz frequency, or the transmitter is going to send from one microwave tower to another in the 4 gigahertz to 6 gigahertz frequency range. And this sort of radio wave is affected a lot by bad weather. Um, I'm not entirely sure why. I I didn't look that up, but I just know that this one tends to be affected quite a bit. I'm trying to think if I would know, but I don't think I do. If it's the microwaves, I do know it could be uh, humidity in the air. Yeah, that's kind of... Stuff could affect it. Probably be my best guess. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so that's microwave radios. The fifth one is Wi-Fi, which I'm sure you all have heard about and probably are listening to this podcast via Wi-Fi. And this stands for Wireless Fidelity. Now, this one uses radio waves to transmit the data, again. And the wireless access points, which I just talked about, they accept connections as the receivers and transmitters. And also, the device uh, that you're using to connect has a receiver and a transmitter. And these are very low power and very common. And these tend to be talked about most frequently when referring to, you know, the wireless internet. We kind of tend to use Wi-Fi and wireless internet interchangeably we use them to mean the same thing but reality it's kind of a it's a subset of all of the wireless technologies that are available to us though it is the most common cool beans so one more thing i want to say about wireless access points so you're probably thinking hang on i don't know what i don't think i have a wireless access point i have a router (laughs) well technically that's true but most routers are actually router wireless access point combos. So they have both a wireless access point and a router involved. And we're going to talk, like I said in a few episodes, about what exactly a router is and what it does. But basically the wireless access point is what gives you the ability to have your own wireless network. And so, you know, when you name your wireless network, I don't know, don't use this Wi-Fi network, that is what the ability to have that Wi-Fi Wi-Fi network is made possible by your wireless access point within your router. So, so that's fun. So I'm going to take a stab in the dark and guess that wireless access point 
shortens to WAP, and that's what a lot of people's uh, passwords are for their wireless access point, I guess, like their WP, WAP 2K or whatever. Oh, no, no, no. no? That's WPA. Oh. And that's that's right. a form of encryption. Okay. Which, actually, I just learned it has been... Uh, it's vulnerable now, so... Yeah. Just be careful, guys. Yeah. <laughs> Your Come Wi-Fi on, is vulnerable. But don't worry. There's nothing you can do about it because there is no other standard. So. <laughs> You're just all equally screwed. Yeah. But stay on WPA2. It's still the most secure. Okay. But so and they're, sta- they're supposed stab to be in the dark it mist. Soon. It's okay. That's actually what I thought at first, but then I realized it was WAP and not WPA. Yep. Yep. And it's okay. I also do this, you know, I I study this in college, so. <laughs> yeah. I, I have yeah, a bit more yeah. expertise than you. Just a little bit. Uh, actually. <laughs> okay so that's wi-fi and then we get bluetooth which i know you guys have probably heard of and then again this one is used is radio waves so a lot of these are just radio waves and this connects devices to their peripherals um and these are ac- accessories just like headphones that's what a peripheral is so headphones keyboards mouses stuff like that but it does it without wires obviously and bluetooth was created by the bluetooth special interest group and so it's a proprietary technology, but they make a killing off of it because everybody uses it. And so, yeah, that's Bluetooth. And then finally, mobile networks, which just use the satellites and radio waves uh, through those sat- satellites. And so mobile networks like 4G and 3G are just satellites. And yeah, not so, that interesting. So I've always wondered, what does 4G and 3G stand for? Or what does it mean? Do you know, Gosh, or is that... I don't know, no. to be honest. Um, I, I should have looked that up, but actually, you know what? I could probably do it right now. Cool. Also, uh, while you're Googling that, how does Bluetooth make money? Like, is it just something that if you install it on the phone or something, you have to pay them? So... Oh, how they... Well, yeah, I think it's like a intellectual property thing. Okay, so they just sell those, the rights to put it on the phone to iTunes or Apple and uh, Google and Android and all that. Right, if okay. you think, you know, intellectual property is an actual thing, but, you know, it's a different topic for another day. <laughs> <laughs> That's such a such a weird debated topic nowadays. It is. And it's a very interesting one that maybe we'll get into later, but who knows? There's there's literally the by definition no limit to the topics that we could discuss on this show. So, I love it. Yep. I love okay, so how 4G we made it. <laughs> so 4G is just I don't it's just 4G. I don't think it stands for anything. Okay. It's the fourth generation of broadband cellular network technology. I'm I'm so, guessing it stands for fourth generation. I would guess. <laughs> um. And then LTE is a long-term evolution. Okay. I know that one. And so, yeah, that's the mobile networks. And so those those are basically your options uh, when it comes to wireless connections. Um, but we're going to primarily talk about Wi-Fi, though the specific technology used isn't important after this layer of the Internet. So you can just, however, whatever way you want these protocol data units to be sent to another host you know, you can use whatever imagination you want after this layer of the internet. But just know that the very bottom layer of the internet is the physical layer. Okay, so there's one more thing I want to mention before we wrap this up, and that is IEEE 802. So IEEE is the... Oh, shoot. International should probably... Electric Engineers... Or yeah. el- Electric and Electronic Engineers. Gosh, I'm going right? to... I'm so upset I don't remember this. But yeah, it's a it's a group of engineers that it's like a club of engineers kind of that meet and and define standards for things and it's you like pay your dues and there's a code of ethics and everything that I was supposed to, you know, learn and everything. But clearly they've made such an impact on my life that <laughs> I'm deeply moved by them. But they are important for this because the IEEE 802 
um, is a family of standards in dealing with the link layer of the internet or the link physical layer of the internet. So this is kind of both. Um, so if you see a number starting with 802 dot something, then you just, just know that that corresponds with a standard put out by IEEE. And so if you're interested in knowing what those mean, then there's a bunch of places to look on the internet and you can just Google them. So if you just, so one of the common technologies you might see is 802.11ac, and that's a standard of wireless technology that IEEE has defined. And if you just Google IEEE 802.11ac, it'll say it'll there'll be documentation by IEEE about this is what exactly all of that refers to. So you'll often see this when you're buying a router or a modem it's that um, that. Uh, defines what standard of you know physical technology it's using so <laughs> yeah it'll probably look intimidating but just know it just refers to a standard that's defined so it uh it stands for the institute of electrical and electronics engineers i was very close yeah uh, and it's it's just like any engineering or law association that comes together to write down a standard to make sure that everyone's practicing somewhat similar. It, yeah. uh, in my field of work, civil engineering, we have the American Society of Civil Engineers. So what they do is they write this book called ASCE 7, which is our standard code for designing buildings. And then they update it every six years. So this is an update, or last year was an update year. So the ASCE 716 and then each chapter is like 0.1 ASCE 716.1 keep on mm -hmm. moving down the line until you get to a specific code and that's basically what this IEEE 802 is yeah so yeah okay so yeah and you know with all that being said that's the best way to explain the physical layer of the internet that's cool I, I didn't know how physical it was going to be you know, yeah. like sometimes they'll say physical and they'll just be like, oh, yeah, that means a mouse or. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but no. So like that, because in order for there to be information sent from one place to another, there needs to be some medium by which that information is transmitted. And because there I mean, there's only two options. You can either do it using a wire or you can do it wirelessly. Then, you know, once you cover those, then what we're what the next layers are going to talk about each layer kind of builds upon um the layer below it and what it does it defines more logical um i don't know what you call it more logical standards and and protocols and formats for uh the layer below it and and it and it makes it easier for us to do more powerful things with you know the these connected uh, hosts and so yeah, that's cool. what we're going to be getting into. Cool. I'm excited to learn more. Should be good. So, yeah, that's all I have to say. Sweet. Well, I, I don't have any other questions or anything, so. I, I feel like, like they almost expect us to ramble on for another yeah, three minutes. For, but for a couple minutes at least. <laughs> how was well, how was your day? <laughs> you know, not bad, you know. <laughs> Actually, dude, I, I've been really struggling with some stuff lately. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, is Nobody it uh, is it two minutes worth of <laughs> stuff, or do we need you a know, phone call? I'll just go on this. for another hour. But okay, yeah, that's cool. Okay, actually, before we lose everybody, let's end it. Yay! That sounds great. All right, so we will. I guess yeah, we'll talk to you next time. Yeah, get learning.